just giving you a glance. Um, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is the trees. Um, and Nina mentioned the, the study we did earlier. I'm going to be talking about that right now. So that we're interested in ultimately, I don't need to persuade anyone how valuable trees are for the global carbon cycle, but I'm trying to understand the global distribution of these forests. And again, I'll keep this panel along the, along the left-hand side so you can remember I'm now talking about the biogeography of trees. So when it comes to the trees, we have a completely different set of problems. Fungi are all hidden below the surface and they're very complex. We can see forests from space, so it's a different set of tools, a different set of questions that we're addressing here. We can see, obviously, there's a huge history, of a rich history of, of forest ecology that tells us, and forestry that tells us all sorts of information about local forests and how to manage them and how they're structured and how they interact. But our understanding of global scale, the global forest system, ultimately comes from satellite information, which tells us where forests are, and a little bit of information about how they can exchange carbon. But they don't tell us that much about what's going on below the surface. Um, and this is the part where Plant for the Planet uh, came into my life. So I became uh, involved with this organization that were restoring trees around the world. And they were, they were actually uh, leading the UN's billion tree campaigns. So they planned to plant a billion trees around the world to help our climate problems. The problem was we didn't know how many trees there were to start with. So they couldn't really generate an understanding of the magnitude of their impact. They couldn't tell quite the, the extent of their efforts and, and really set meaningful restoration targets. Oh, sugar. So I, this is where I got involved. And I wasn't necessarily interested in the global tree number per se. I'm not so focused on population numbers. But I was interested in the idea because this is, in order to do that, we needed to generate a spatial understanding of forest structure. And this is, well, I've got a video that will talk you through the process. Trees are some of the most prominent organisms on the planet. They prevent soil erosion, store water and nutrients, provide habitats for thousands of plants and animals, help offset the damaging impacts of climate change by absorbing CO2, produce oxygen that we need to breathe, and directly improve human happiness and well-being. Because of all these benefits, the United Nations Environment Program and various other organizations have invested huge amounts of time and money in order to plant one billion trees around the world. However, the impact of this effort is uncertain because until recently, no one knew how many trees there were to begin with. Would planting a billion trees increase the total count by 1% or 50%? Could a billion trees help our climate problems or would it just be a drop in the bucket? Our current understanding of the global forest extent comes from satellite images, which provide valuable information about forest area and canopy cover, but they cannot tell us about everything that is going on below the surface. So, a research team from Yale University in the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies set out to map the world's trees. With help from scientists all over the globe, they collected thousands of ground-sourced tree density measurements in hectare-sized plots. They paired tree density in each plot with satellite images of forest cover, and they integrated information about soil type, topography, climate, and human disturbance. Using all of this information, they constructed predictive equations which allowed them to estimate how many trees are likely to exist in any given area based on its similarity to environments with known tree numbers. The resulting map is the first of its kind. It reveals not only where all the trees on Earth are located, but it also tells us about the density and environmental structure of the world's forests. It can help us to understand which environmental conditions are best for supporting trees, which habitats might be suitable for plants and animals around the world, and how carbon storage varies across landscapes. By adding up the values in each square kilometer pixel, the Yale team was able to estimate that the total number of trees on Earth stands at about three trillion. This number was considerably higher than scientists had previously expected. The study also shows that we have reduced the number of trees by almost half since the start of human civilization, and we're losing 15 billion trees each year. In other words, the number of trees cut down every year is twice as big as the total number of humans on Earth. So now we, have, we all have the answer to a nice pub quiz question. Um, ultimately, the, 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 the sort of end, goal, end, end result was for plant, for the plant for the Planet, we showed that 
by using a combination of ground source data and satellite information, we estimate there's approximately three trillion trees on Earth. And obviously the relevance of this for them was, was very useful. If you imagine each of these, these trees here is a billion trees, this is how many trees currently exist on Earth. And this was the contribution of the Billion Tree Campaign, which is great, but it's not the magnitude of the impact that they're looking for. So it's now the Trillion Tree Campaign. And when they achieve this, they're really going to have a meaningful impact at a global scale. And obviously, this sounds like a ludicrous goal. But it, since that, published, that study was published, they've already planted 14 billion new trees. So they've really, you know, having these new targets, allowing, setting these new, new strategies has allowed them to really ramp up their efforts. And they're moving incredibly well towards their goals. And maybe one day they'll reach it. And this spatially explicit map of tree populations helps us also to understand how many trees are lost each year and the, po the potential for new forest gain uh, if we were to restore around the world. So there's possible, possible, possible space for another 1.3 trillion trees. But the value for me of this global forest map isn't just in the tree numbers. Ultimately, we've made a spatially explicit map of tree density. And for anyone who's walked around in some forests, you can, you'll know the difference between an open forest and a closed forest, a very dense forest. Open forests will have a very different subset of understory vegetation. Different plants and animals can exist there. Even indirectly, carbon and nutrients and water are recycled differently within these ecosystems. So the density of the forest is actually a really important habitat or component of the habitat structure. So these maps have now been useful in uh, understanding and modeling species distributions and, and biodiversity patterns at a global scale because they can help us to say which species might, ex might be able to live in which regions. And actually, it was recently used in that map that I showed you at the very beginning as one of the very simple base layers of information to provide a, a, a small amount of ecological information that can be helped to, to parameterize those, those global scale carbon cycle models. But obviously, the density of trees is a an, is an useful indirect uh, piece of information about the forest structure. But what we're ultimately interested in, in is the carbon storage and the carbon cycle. So we've now stepped up our, up our efforts. That original study was based on 400,000 pl 400, plots of tree density. And we've now got 1.2 million forest inventory plots that include information about stem density, but also the basal area. So that's the, the sort of the, the size of the trees within the, each of those plots, and also the species identity of every single tree in those plots. So this is a huge spatial coverage of the world's forests, where we have real on-the-ground information calculate, you know, calculated by foresters standing on the ground. And by simply pairing that information up with the globally available satellite information, we can really improve our picture of the global forest system. So the first thing we did, actually, was to explore a very simple thing, but an ongoing question in, in, uh, in community ecology. And that's the relationship between the number of species in a plot and the, and the amount of productivity, the, the amount of biomass that's produced by that plot. And we find consistently, at a global scale, plots with more species have a greater p potential to capture carbon and to, to put on biomass and to, to fill their space. And the idea behind that is a simple one. Ultimately. Communities comprised of the same species will com be competing in the same way for the same resources, and they'll clash with one another. You know, they're not able to capture the light and nutrients as efficiently as they might hope. Whereas co uh, plots comprised of very different species have different strategies for capturing light, different strategies for capturing nutrients and water, and so they will, they'll fill different niches, and they'll be able to more efficiently capture all of those resources and grow more effectively. And the consequence of that study actually had, there was quite clear economic implications. Because in terms of timber, the value of the world's forests at the moment are estimated at approximately, for the timber industry and pulp and paper globally, are estimated at approximately $616 billion per year. And there's ongoing debate in different regions of the world whether it's worth replacing those forests with monocultures of the most productive forest, the most productive tree species, because maybe that will be capturing a lot, more, uh, a lot more carbon and producing a lot more timber. But our estimate was, if we, were to, if we were to do that globally, convert the world's forest into a monoculture of the most productive species, the annual budget in terms of timber would fall to about 406 billion. So that's a 200 billion uh, deficit each year. And that's actually seven or eight times greater than the total amount of money that we currently spend on forest conservation. So it's sort of an economic um, reason to be, confer to be conserving diversity within our forests at a global scale. And actually, this is uh, very preliminary information. So I should, I should stress, this is um, 
the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the conclusion that I stressed earlier about the relationship between species diversity and productivity, that's a global scale conclusion. So we're, we're not looking at the, the regions in which these relationships matter. So we're starting to break that down now. And this is some very preliminary evidence that has been compiled by um, a master's student in our lab, Hao Zhe Ma. And he's actually looking at the relationships between species within each of the pixels around the world. So he's combined various pixels, and he's looking at whether species do facilitate one another or if they actually antagonize one another and actually compete more aggressively against one another. And he's finding evidence that in the, in the warm and moist parts of the world, we're actually seeing that individuals are competing for those, optimal, for those optimal resources, those optimal conditions. They're competing incredibly aggressively, and actually there's negative associations between species, whereas it's the positive facilitative interactions we're seeing much more commonly in the dry or, more, or cold parts of the world. Where it's harsh, you then start to see facilitation a lot more. So it's not necessarily a simple global relationship. We need to start to understand these patterns and understand the ways in which plants are interacting with one another before we can say where, this, you know, where diversity is most valuable for productivity. But of course, the, one of the, you know, the main thing we're going to be doing with these global data sets is simply generating spatially explicit information about the global forest system. So we're currently involved in projects looking at biomass production, productivity, basic attributes of the global forest system that we are very poorly constrained at the moment, very, very poorly understood at the moment. And this basic information is going to be very valuable for our ability to predict the carbon cycle. And we're also looking at various traits that might be distributed across the world's forests so we can understand uh, the structure of these forests very well. But I'm just showing you here a map of, that we've recently finished and we've, we've just submitted. This is a uh, map of the mycorrhizal status of the world's forests. Now that we know information about all the types of species of tree that exist across the world, every tree is affiliated with a certain group of mycorrhizal fungi. And because now we know where all the trees are, we can say something about the types of fungi that are existing below the soil. So actually, by having this global scale above ground information, we're, we're starting to get new insights into the way that the below ground world is structured. And this will be one of the first global soil biodiversity type maps. So I hope in my talk, I've sort of explained some of the 